deliver an application that is strong, uh, is uh, consistent with the goals of the local planning resource program, and essentially helps your application score well. Muted. So you can see those goals there. Um, we'll be going through uh, the program goals and requirements, uh, examples on how the Wasatch Choice for 2040 tools can be incorporated, and of course answering questions that you have as we go through. Now, as I think uh, this is generally known, but just briefly, this is a $600,000 per year program, which is broken up the way that you see. Wasatch Front's resources uh, come from a pot of money called uh, STP, stands for Surface Transportation Projects Program. I always get the P mixed up. And uh, so the breakdown of, uh, of our money, 140 to Ogden Layton, uh, metro area and 260 for Salt Lake is based on, is proportional to population and we have to break it out that way. And then Salt Lake County is matching our funds uh, just for Salt Lake County. So there's 460 available for Salt Lake County and 140 for Ogden Lane. Wanted you to let, to let you know the, why that is the way it is. So one of the things you're asked to do is to write a page that talks about how your application is consistent with the local planning resource program goals, okay? You can note that there, discuss how your application furthers the program goals and, uh, and utilizes the Wasatch Choice for 2040 toolbox. And so let me talk about goals one by one. Uh, the first one is really a slide. Uh, which is the, is the number one reason why this program exists is, is to help you accomplish what uh, your objective in creating a great community. And so that should be implied by the fact that you're applying. The second thing is that uh, it gives you an opportunity to think about um, the region. How is what you're doing affecting the metropolitan area as a whole. And so you can uh, go to the uh, Wasatch Choice for 2040 and look at the growth principles. But a lot of them are really, frankly, related to the next two goals, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. One is that um, your application in some way reduces future travel demand from what it might have otherwise been by enabling shorter commutes and providing more bicycling, walking, and transit opportunities. Now what we thought we would do is deconstruct that goal a little bit and illustrate some strategies that might lead to less travel demand. Uh, and before, I guess before I get into this, this is, a, this is something that uh, makes sense for a metropolitan planning organization to do. We're trying to uh, help the region be mobile and half of that is how much demand we have to get around and half of that is how we supply that demand. So demand reduction is a core aspect of this. So this gets at strategies like, this is not an exhaustive list, it does, this doesn't list every idea that might reduce travel demand, but it gives you a sense, it's a cross section of things. Um, if you live, if your community is in a job heavy part of the region, like northern Salt Lake County, then more ho homes in that area um, would tend to reduce uh, travel distances. Likewise, if you're in a residential heavy part of the metropolitan area, like, uh, for example, uh, northern Davis County uh, or south Davis, Davis County as a whole, then more jobs in that area would help. A mix of uses within a smaller area, like a block or in a district, that helps enable more walking and bicycling. That's number two. Connecting streets helps shorten travel distances and enables more things to be within a walk and bike distance. Uh, efficient use of parking is a core component that, uh, that helps land be more efficiently utilized and supports other modes of transportation. Uh, Transit-oriented development or simply putting jobs or housing near transit helps people 
give them that choice. Uh, density near jobs reduces travel demand, walkable buildings and sites, the way they themselves are designed, as well as the infrastructure as well, which are about eight and nine. Eight, of course, focusing on bicycling infrastructure in your community. Nine, on safe and comfortable walking routes. And then 10, uh, if more growth in a community happens through reinvestment, let's say it's through a Main Street, for example, then that um, has a substitution effect and replaces growth that might have otherwise occurred in uh, less uh, central locations or less convenient locations that uh, might be greenfield. So that tends to reduce travel demand as well. So that's just giving you a cross section. If you think if you can talk about how your application might achieve uh, some of these kinds of travel demand strategies or others that are not on this list. That's helpful in the review of your application. The next program goal is, uh, is quote, provide technical assistance for challenging planning projects. Part of the concept here is that the program is helping a community do the kinds of planning that it can't do uh, in-house with existing staff. So this might be, for example, um, uh, attending to a revitalization of an, ex an existing area. That's a challenging planning need. Or it could be mixing uses. Uh, that also can be a little bit more challenging than planning, let's say, a subdivision or an office park. Some of these things that are a little trickier, they might be trickier because of the public engagement efforts. They might be trickier technically because of the uh, conditions of the land. but those are uh, where there is a, a need that can't be met unless there are additional resources brought to bear. Those are things that we're trying to be strategic about using this program for. And then uh, five, collaboration between, between governments. It could even just be the city next to you um, and thinking about, let's say, a corridor that you share. Uh, but those kinds of planning needs um, are difficult for individual uh, local governments to address. And so that's part of the program goals as well. And so these are all listed within the application form. And again, there's a one-page write-up that you can provide uh, that gets at, at um, how your application meets those, those uh, program uh, goals. Now, you don't have to hit every single one, but talk about those that you feel like your application does resonate with. Eligible projects, uh, all of your letters of intent, I think, cleared this barrier already, but I wanted to just lay this out in case you uh, are have the, a question in your head about whether you can also explore slightly different or additional things in your application. So for example, you could have a standalone training activity that uh, you ask for in addition to what you're doing. Uh, complete streets policy, that might be a subcomponent of a larger project where, whereby you examine the, um, the standards for how a road is uh, built or modified, uh, the policies within your community about street design. Planning and zoning and visioning, I think, are pretty well understood. Um, but you can also explore more specific technical um, projects like uh, market studies, just to get a handle on where the market is and will be in your community so that you can uh, dovetail your plans to uh, market, market needs. Uh, and now I mentioned this complete streets policy, and I won't elaborate on it very long, but uh, we just wanted you to know that this is an option as well. This is not a listed project type a year ago, and so it's new for inclusion this time. And if you have questions about it, um, we'll open that up in the Q&A. And so now I'll turn it over to uh, Julia to talk about um, next steps. Great. Thanks, Ted. Um, so the slide that we currently have on the screen um, is the section within the application as to where you would 
um, select what type of project you are interested in pursuing through your application. And um, we just wanted to get you familiar with where this is um, within um, the exact application. So as you'll see, there is um, um, it's a drop-down list and, and where you would select. So the same thing goes for this next section in the Wasa Choice for 2040 tools. While the tools are not required, um, you know, we do ask within the goals you consider to explore them. And this is not an exhaustive list, more um, maybe the most common ones that would use. And then um, as you'll see from further on in the presentation, um, that there are other tools um, just for that particular slot at the bottom um, that are available that you could also write in. So, um, and um, they are on the Wasa Choice for 2040 website and also on the um, Local Planning Resource Program website within the WFRC.org website framework. So the first one we wanted to um, go over is the um, Envisioning Centers tool. And this was part of the uh, Wasa Choice for 2040 partnership, um, but mainly developed by Envision Utah. Um, and this is a planning and implementation process for public participation. Um, this outlines and illustrates the scenario planning process and allows a range of options and the ability to weigh benefits and challenges. Um, <clears throat> the user creates the framework, but as you'll see from this diagram, um, the key questions that you ask through that process, um, these tools and resources can be used to help um, the local government better explore um, the answers to these questions and brings you through that framework from visioning all the way through to implementation with these proper resources to measure the progress. Envision Tomorrow Plus um, is the scenario planning tool. Um, it's been getting a lot of traction um, in a lot of the projects that we've seen from 2014. Um, the tool itself consists of a set of Excel spreadsheets that work together with ArcGIS, the mapping software, and allows um, the user to explore a variety of development scenarios. And this begins with um, what the work that's already been completed for you by the Wasa Choice 2040 is specific prototypes and buildings that have been calibrated to Utah. And then um, it allows the user to create development types that represent plausible future land use conditions um, at the parcel level and at the regional level. And ET Plus then provides outcomes and incomes, uh, impacts through the various land use scenarios um, with a variety of about 22 different outputs that you can compare and contrast between the two different scenarios. And this slide um, is just an example of what you could potentially paint. On the left, you'll see the different place types or um, building prototypes, whichever you would want to build. And then you can paint at the parcel level, um, or you can paint at the block level, or you could paint even at, um, you know, at the center level. And then you would get those variety of scenario place types. For example, this one um, is a project that we um, partnered with the city of Centerville on. And we have four scenarios. And this shows um, the four different scenarios, what type of sales and property tax outputs you could compare and, and contrast um, depending on what you've painted. And this um, is just one use for ET+, Plus, but this is probably one of the most common uses that we've seen um, in the projects that have come through. Um, Form-based code. <clears throat> so. Um, as you all are pretty familiar with form-based codes, um, this is an ordinance type that emphasizes physical form rather than um, being more use-based to regulate and guide development. Sets a design standard rather than minimum requirements and encourages active, vibrant communities that are both functional and aesthetically pleasing. And the manual and template that's been created um, basically brings the user through step-by-step -step development to create this code. It's calibrated um, to fit the needs of the individual communities and allows you, um, through the use of a workbook, to some more support the community vision and um, complete the highly um, illustrative and design-based code based on your community's preferences. And this really has, this tool, because of the graphics um, and a lot of the um, steps 
really gives you that leg up and gets over that initial burden <clears throat> that may incur as a result of moving towards a form-based type of code. <clears throat> and I'm going to hand this one over to Ted to take over the next two tools. The Utah Community Data Project just launched uh, about a year ago through the University of Utah, and it is a rich source of data about existing conditions and I think recent trends also for your community that could play a variety of different planning, uh, fill a variety of different planning needs for your community. So for example, let's say you're doing your uh, affordable housing uh, element of your general plan. This should give you most of the information that you need for your community. Um, and one of the reasons why it's listed, so it's listed because it's just a great resource in general, but it also highlights the way that your community uh, is meeting the needs of lower income and underserved populations which is an important planning objective. And so by just shedding light on that uh, aspect, uh, there's hope that, uh, that that information can be used and inform some strategies that improve those kinds of outcomes. So I encourage you to take a look at that. That's one of the things. And then uh, green infrastructure is a growing planning uh, concept it's a name essentially for the interconnected system of natural and social, uh, what is the, what is, I can't see my little slide, sorry, interconnected <laughs> network of natural and social, I didn't even need the slide, I know this cold, it's so funny that any of you would think I didn't know that, uh, absolutely cold. Um, and so we're talking about here a system of parks and open space, uh, it could be protected floodplains, wetlands, and how these work together to create an overall system. And so what does that mean with regard to a toolbox, a tool itself? So there's two different things. One is that Wasatch Front adopted a plan called ReConnect, which has two things that might be useful for you. One, there is a set of GIS data that maps out green infrastructure resources. And so there are maps that you can look at, but you can also just pull the GIS data itself and use it in planning processes. There's also a set of implementation strategies or best practices associated with that plan, reconnect. And then uh, as another option, uh, let's say that you, your community has some uh, riverfront or creek front land that you want to uh, address. And so Blueprint Jordan River and the, and the Jordan River Commission produced best practices for riverfront communities that you can also draw upon. <clears throat> Thanks, Ted. Um, moving right along, um, the Implementing Centers uh, tool is one of my favorites as it is easy to use um, and quite quick. Um, it's completely online and it is a guidebook for communities to understand um, the proper development and assess barriers um, to mixed-use centers and also provide development strategies on how to overcome um, the barriers that have been identified. And it allows users to um, go into visioning, planning, um, and development steps after taking um, all of these appropriate steps beforehand. So, um, the tool provides a detailed step-by-step -step guide, um, as shown here on the screen, um, asking you questions and providing links within the guidebook um, to kind of a educational and adaptable um, solution to the potential barriers. And um, this is also, uh, I guess, all of the resources that we're listing here are free, and we may not have said that right from the beginning. So. Um, they're all free and available whether, um, you know, you're using them in this project or not, but um, just wanted to highlight that you don't, don't need to pay for them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so moving along to the streets plan, this is a um, web-based platform with a simple graphic interface designed to foster dialogue between the public and community leaders on the streetscape. 
it has extensive graph graphics, it's really easy to use, and allows a collective group to visualize the street. You can compare and modify street alternatives. There's interactive elements and um, review um, and inform your regional plans, allows for visualizing the right-of-way constraints. You can build your, your street as you see. Also helps, um, you know, as we're seeing this in projects, planning commission and as a dialogue tool. And that summarizes all of the resources that we wanted to highlight today. This is not an exhaustive list. Per se, um, there are a couple other resources that have been created, and you know you're not limited to utilizing these resources within your application. Um, it, it has been brought up that the Utah um, Active Transportation Master Plan Design Guide is another great one to bring in here if you're looking at pursuing um, an Active Transportation Master Plan. So, um, you know, if you have any questions about that, we can answer that in the Q and A. But know that this is not exhaustive. So. Um, the slide on the screen is the application process where we are. Um, as you'll see, we're on step number three with the webinar today. Um, and from here, here on, Val's going to take over and talk about step number four and um, the application itself that's due on January 15th. Thank you, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've taken a look at the goals and objectives of the, planning, of the local resource planning program. We've also examined some of the tools that are available. This next steps is uh, a pragmatic look at exactly what needs to take place in so far as the application is concerned. So take a look at the list, if you will. Um, focus your attention on number three. We would like the project to be ultimately adopted into your general plan or by your your community's uh, council, uh, and that's kind of an important one. Uh, if possible, we would uh, prefer not to have uh, the project or the plan sit on a shelf somewhere collecting dust, but rather be implemented uh, through action on the part of uh, officials in the community. Uh, let me run down this real quick. So uh, the application needs to be consistent with uh, local planning resource program goals, which we've gone over. Uh, we're going to judge uh, the quality and completeness of the application. Three, whether or not the application uh, covers a step that allows the project to be adopted by the, your city or community council. And then uh, how quick or how ready is the project to, uh, to, to start? Your financial match will be taken into consideration as far as evaluating the, uh, the application itself your in-kind match, and then the use of Wasatch Choice for 2040 tools, and finally, cost effectiveness. So this is somewhat competitive. The applications will be judged using uh, these uh, criteria. Next. So uh, in submitting an application, uh, some detail is required, and no more than six pages are allowed we would like you to submit a scope of work that generally outlines what needs to be done as far as the project is concerned, a schedule or an idea of how long the uh, project should take, then maybe a list of deliverables, and, and finally and finally a budget. So again, uh, it's important to note that we would also like to have your staff be an integral part of this process, so it would be important to include them also. Next. And if there are any questions on how to procure a budget, um, our staff could help you with that, as I know there's also been questions arise as well. This is an important part of the application process, your, your match. So a local financial match is, uh, is required. The minimum required is 6.77% of the amount of money you're asking for. In addition to the financial match, we're asking for a local in-kind match. In other words, uh, labor that's, uh, that's provided by your staff members, your planning staff. And sure. Part of the reason why we're asking for your labor commitment is uh, the concept here is that uh, for a project to be 
successful, the best way to assure that is that you, the local government, you own it. You are the primary contact with the project team and that you're doing the work you need to in-house if you can to make it a success and that you really own it. It's not simply something, a project that is done entirely uh, outside of your purview right, and your management. So that's the concept. That's, it's more showing us that you're committed to it. Uh, now, a question has come up in the past for communities that have a very small staff. Let's say you don't even have a, a you don't have a dedicated full-time uh, planner on staff. We will definitely take that into account. This is not something that is a fatal flaw. If you're a smaller community and you can't afford to put a lot of hours of labor towards an effort, we understand. Just talk about that, uh, those limitations in your application. Next. These are some guidelines that will help you with the application itself. If you're requesting if you're requesting amounts of $20,000 or more, we're, we're asking that a minimum 10% be placed up front as far as financial con uh, commitment is concerned, and we're suggesting 25%, which I guess is quite a bit of skin in the game. But again, as Ted mentioned, it shows a, a certain level of commitment on your part to ensure the success of the uh, project itself. For amounts under $20,000 in assistance, we're asking for uh, a minimum financial match of uh, 10%. Uh, again, uh, all that's really required by the federal government is 6.77, but uh, this is competitive, and so uh, a minimum financial match of 10% really isn't uh, beyond the, uh, the bounds of, uh, of expectation. Then finally, uh, in-kind match, labor hours. Uh, Folks have asked whether or not this includes uh, all staff hours. Uh, again, some areas may not have uh, as many folks dedicated to planning as, as other communities, and so the, the labor hours will depend in part on how much personal time and staff time you can devote to making this project a success. Uh, again, those, th th that will vary significantly in accordance with the type of project and the size of your staff. Next. I can't go. The type of assistance, just very briefly, um, three general types with uh, another fourth one offered as a possibility. The three types of assistance is staff time assistance, WFRC staff time devoted to the project, either, uh, either uh, in part or in whole, uh, consulting, and we'll go over that in just a moment. There's a consultant pool that's been readily selected and available. And then uh, on-site training. If you require training, if your staff requires training and some of these tools, we're happy to provide such. There is another box here that says Others Specify, and we can open that up to uh, uh, any type of assistance that you think would, uh, would, be, would qualify under the grant itself. Now, what if they don't know what kind of assistance? They want okay, then I think it probably would be good for uh, that particular city to contact us and, and let us help them select the type of assistance that we think would work best. Yeah, and, and I think if you, if you don't really know, if you don't have a strong preference or you don't know, I think that's okay. It's okay for you to say willing to explore options. Uh, this is just in case you have a clear sense of how you want to proceed. But you don't have to know this um, going into an application. This is the, uh, the consultant pool. And uh, it mentions that it's subject to change because we have recently opened up the pool and we'll be allowing uh, additional consultants to, to be added to this list. But uh, if you take a look at, there's three general categories. There's technical assistance and training. And these are consultants who have been earmarked to provide such. The middle one there is for general planning. Uh, again, a host of uh, local and national firms with local representation here are represented, uh, very qualified uh, firms, consultants, individuals. 
And then finally, uh, ordinance writing, uh, a handful of consultants who are capable in providing uh, assistance in, uh, in, in this technical area. If I may, part of what we uh, are trying to do with this consultant pool is make the process of picking and procuring and getting under contract a consultant really pain, relatively pain-free. And we did that by pre-screening them. So they have to apply to get onto the pool, tell us their qualifications to do these three categories of work. And then we also need to make sure that the funds are uh, awarded based on a competitive process. We have to do that on our end, uh, given that we're a governmental entity, essentially. And so that clears those hurdles already. And so the notion here is $50,000 threshold, that under a $50,000, if your project has a budget of under $50,000, you can pick off of this pool without going through any procurement process, if you want to. Now, if you want to select, let's say, a small handful of these and then pick between them, then you can do that as well. Uh, and the required process is really streamlined to do that. Um, we have a, a name for it. It's called a request for pool letter of qualifications, or RPLOC. It's an acronym that is sweeping the nation. And so uh, that's the concept behind the pool. Now, so one additional thing to note about this is a team of consultants could come forward and do the work. The requirement then is that the lead firm is on the pool. After that, the sub-consultants to that lead can be off of this list. They don't have to be on this list. But you actually are limited uh, if you want to use consulting uh, services to this list, which is a pretty uh, solid list of local and some national firms. And again, it, it very likely will be growing uh, moving forward. Um, so thanks. Next. One essential part of the application process is buy-in by the, uh, the mayor or the head of the community itself. So we're going to require that a signature be secured from the mayor so that he or she knows about the application itself and what the expectations are as far as time commitment on the part of uh, planning staff and, and the match itself. So. Uh, we're going to require a signature from the chief executive officer, the mayor, um, in order to process the application. So this is a simple checklist. Uh, the blue boxes need to be filled in. Uh, all projects uh, need to complete these, uh, these five areas. Uh, you need to check off that they meet local planning resource goals. There needs to be an overall scope of work, deliverables, schedule, and budget. Again, six pages maximum. And then finally, the uh, signature from uh, of support from uh, the mayor, him or herself. So there's some uh, additional supplemental material that you could include if you're so inclined, aerial photographs, uh, maps, delineating the project area. If, if you feel inclined, go ahead and include those. They do not count toward the uh, page maximum limits. Val, I'm just going to throw one more thing in on that um, bottom red text where it says, please submit information in electronic copy and keep it in an Excel format. This helps us immensely. Um, instead of converting it to a PDF, I know it's cleaner, um, but we just pull all the information. We cut and paste it into a, um, a, a more um, malleable uh, format for us to evaluate. So we appreciate you all just sending it in in Excel. And finally, uh, these are frequently asked questions, just some uh, uh, general questions to get your thoughts flowing in this next section, which is Q&A. Uh, how and when do I apply? You'll need to apply before January 15th, and, and hopefully we've, we've covered how. But we can cover some details if you have questions concerning such. Uh, can you send us a draft and have us look at such? Yeah, we would welcome that opportunity to take a look at uh, a draft application. Uh, 
you know, we, we've stepped through this process one time before, so we're pretty adept at determining what uh, the application should have in order for it to uh, remain fairly competitive. Uh, does my mayor have to sign this? Yes, indeed, uh, as covered in just, uh, just a few moments ago. Will you write me a check? Uh, this is an unqualified no. Uh, the, the money itself, the match money, will eventually be folded into the requested amount for the grant itself, and WFRC will administer those funds and will pay the, uh, the consultant if the consultant uh, is the option selected. So the city itself will not receive a check in any amount whatsoever. Ted wants to add something, I think. This is something that uh, when we originally set up this program, we anticipated giving cash <coughs> directly to communities. And as we uh, worked with our federal partners on the requirements that it would take, what we learned is that uh, for you to receive federal money, you would have to essentially um, uh, fill out a federal aid agreement, which essentially means that there's a lot of paperwork to clear that hurdle, which uh, is, would be a big burden on you as local government. So the notion here is that uh, you get the same level of control as if you got the money. You get to pick the project team. Uh, you get to develop the scope. They can develop or you can develop the scope of work as long as it's consistent with your application. You manage the team. You have all the control that you would normally have. But at the end of the day, the contract itself is going to be between, if you use a consultant, it's going to be between that consultant team and Wasatch Front so that you don't have to go through the rig uh, rigmarole. I don't even know what that word means, but you don't have to go through that to uh, to get that federal money. Does that, I hope that makes sense. And so Val was talking about, well, okay, so what happens to the cash match? What we would do is we would gather the project's financial resources, which would include the, the amount of resources that you're awarded. Let's say that you ask for 40,000 and you get 40,000. 40,000 of awarded resources plus, let's say your cash match is 10,000 so that together you have a $50,000 project. So we would have that $50,000. We would invoice you for your $10,000 cash match. We'd have the $50,000 available. And then through whatever process made sense, uh, you'd identify the project team. And then there would be a contract up to that $50,000 level with that, uh, with that team. And then you would, again, continue to manage that team just as if the money had gone to you. And so I hope that makes sense. I think that you're all unmuted. And so if you have follow-up questions to this. So I'm going to jump in here. Thanks, Ted. Um, if you look on your screen in that box, of the web, go to webinar box, um, you have a green icon next to your microphone or your little telephone icon. Um, a lot of you are self-muted, so you just need to click on that and unmute yourself. So um, now we can open this up to an interactive Q&A. Um, so if you all just want to take a moment and, and look at that, you had to have um, inputted your, your audio PIN number to get to that point. Um, if you're unable to unmute yourself, we do have that question box at the bottom, and we will be referring to that to see if anyone um, is typing any questions in as well. Um, one additional thing I wanted to add to the type of assistance, um, you know, we had mentioned a lot about consulting assistance, but um, WFRC can provide staff assistance. And not only does this mean that you'll see um, a lot of our smiling faces helping you guys, but there are some key advantages um, to having us come and, and work with you and your team. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Ted, or if you wanted to have yeah, me take so this over. What are those advantages? Uh, frankly, that we can uh, give you more time per, uh, per buck, in a sense. Okay, we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to help you to try to make money. We're just trying to help you to make the project a success. We would bill our time against the available resources, 
But let's say that we run past that, we wouldn't stop working. We just keep, our goal is to make the project a success and the rate at which we would um, put our time against the available project resources is, is traditionally uh, significantly less than a consultant's uh, rate. So we're not trying to say, hey, don't use a consultant, but there might be a role for Wasatch Front that you may consider. We can chat with you. Um, there is no uh, problem either way. If, it, if you decide that that's a benefit to the project, we th we're happy to play that role. If you decide that it's, it's not uh, a benefit to the project, then we don't have to. So, um, and just to be clear, we often uh, work with consultant teams and play a role within a project that makes sense. So just keep that in mind. Uh, that's not anything I think you need to work out in the application, but uh, you might noodle on that. So that includes things like Envision Tomorrow Plus utilization. It includes things like uh, potentially working with you to calibrate the form-based code template to your community. It may include public engagement, public involvement steps or, uh, or processes. Uh, a, a lot of the tool application, we're really familiar with the tools. Um, so that gives you a sense. We're not going to be a one-stop shop for uh, all of uh, uh, your planning needs, um, perhaps like a very large consulting firm, but we, we, we might be able to stretch the dollars a little bit further depending on what you're looking to do. Awesome. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> so now it's your turn. Um, we, have, we don't have any questions in the, the question box, but anyone on the line want to ask us a question? <laughs> Julia, Chris Colley from the town of Alta. Perfect. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hi. Hey, uh, how about a, a, a timeline for implementation of the project after grants are awarded? Is there, is there a timeline, a deadline, uh, et cetera? There's, there is no deadline. Um, that's part of... Uh, Part of the application is to assess uh, how ready you are as a community to move forward to, to uh, the kickoff of a project and maybe and also what your general timeline is to complete a project. So it's a consideration, but I will say this just to uh, maybe put everybody at ease that we recognize that uh, local government, uh, sometimes it takes some time. It might take some time to work through a project and get, uh, let's say, your council and your planning commission on the same page that they feel comfortable doing the work. Or maybe there's some work to uh, do internally just among the staff. And so if it does end up taking a fair amount of time, we understand that that's, uh, that's part of, of uh, potentially what you might need to do. But on the other hand, uh, having your ducks in a row does strengthen your application. So I intended to be purposely vague because one size doesn't fit all, but it is a consideration. Thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> Moving along, who's next? <laughs> Come on, try and stump us. <laughs> Uh, Chris, could I offer a bit of a, 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 a little suggestion? I know that John Nebstead is on your planning commission, and, and I think John would be very, very helpful in uh, determining what type of project uh, Alta City should apply for or make application for. Uh, I would did, suggest. Did Ned Hacker tell you to say that this morning? Actually, actually, I talked with I talked with Ned and. Um, I know you've been struggling with uh, trying to determine exactly what type of project would best fit Alta City. Um, John's a great resource. Uh, having worked here at the WFRC and having been a consultant now for Chi about the last 15 years, he's, uh, he would be a good resource to help you out on this. Yeah, thanks for that suggestion. Well, we're definitely working with John. So. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. <clears throat> Anyone else?
All right, well, well some, oh, go for sorry, it. Sorry, You're uh, fine. Um, so, you know, in our particular uh, letter of intent, um, you know, we indicated, uh, uh, you know, sort of request for consulting services and then request for training in uh, ET plus, or sorry, in uh, in vision in Wasa Choice for 2040 toolbox items. Um, how essential is it that um, I, I guess I guess the way that I imagine that was that it would be sort of like a two-part item wherein um, myself or another person um, gets training in order to allow us to facilitate practice planning in-house that may or may not be related to to the consulting services we seek. Um, am I making sense? Uh, do those sort of lobes of the request need to be more unified for competitive purposes, or maybe I'll, I'll I'll react to that? I think that they don't necessarily need to be unified. You may you may and and forgive me, I don't know what what the crux of your letter of intent was, but if if you have a specific planning need that you need to fulfill in your community and you're also interested in receiving uh, some training on a tool or a few tools that are, is not related, that still is, is fine to ask for. Uh, not a problem to, to, uh, to do those separately if you need to. Um, there's also always a plus, of course, if you consider the use of tools within the actual uh, planning uh, project itself. So if that's all the questions on the phone line, we're going to switch over to the ones that have been asked in the text box. Um, the first one is, if we have used one of your consultants recently, can they be considered as part of the match? The, the match would be um, at the time that the, would have to be after the award is made. So there's no credit uh, given for past uh, utilization of, of a consultant. If you, let's say you have a consultant under contract and their work hasn't, even if the consultant contract has been set, that's even, that's even too late. Um, it could be that uh, you're, you, I mean, I'm just, I'm just brainstorming. Let's say that you're a community and you're doing uh, a market feasibility study with a consultant and that's consultant is not yet under contract and you want to do that and it dovetails with this planning process, you might be able to explore that as a match with us. That's a possibility. But um, generally that has to all, all be uh, contracted at least after the award has been made. Minimum. And we'd have to work out the other details. Another question, how many applications were received from each area? And what is a reasonable request amount? Um, and that's a difficult question. Um, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll start with the first one. How many applications were received? Um, we had about 42 applications come in from 23 unique cities. Um, they were pretty um, well split. I would say the majority of them came in from the Weber, Davis, and Fox Outer County area. Um, and about $700,000 were asked from that area, um, for which we have 140000 available. And then in Salt Lake County, we had a little over $600,000 asked, for which we have a little over 400000 available. So I think... Ted's looking like he wants to jump in here, so I'm going to pass the baton off to him. Just relative to the second part of that question, uh, what is a reasonable request amount? What I'd suggest to you is to think about the resources that you need to make your project work and go ahead and ask for that amount. Don't be shy about asking for an amount that, that you would need. What we want to make sure is that the recipients that um, are awarded, that they're in a position where they can be successful. Now, um, the amount to ask for, or perhaps thinking about the project scope and how it relates to available resources, um, 
obviously it's related to the amount of funds. So if you're in uh, the ogden Layton metro area, and let's say you propose a $100,000 project, that's going to be a, a challenge for us to fund unless it, is an, it, is, it scores incredibly well in the application process. Uh, so maybe the concept in, it, it's certainly less than 100000 in in uh, Ogden Layton, but you know, um, at, uh, hopefully that still, and we anticipate that that would still meet a, a broad variety of planning needs uh, under that threshold. Um, and in Salt Lake County, uh, you know, likewise, I, I think generally under a hundred thousand uh, is is the contemplation. Um, I we have not. Let's see here. Anyway, that's just a, maybe a ballpark threshold. I think if your if your project really needs resources beyond that, uh, go ahead and submit it. But it might be more difficult for for it to be um, awarded unless unless it is a, a very strong application that scores well in a number of different areas. <clears throat> No, that's good. I think that's good. It's a, it's a typical question. Um, the next one would be, who manages the project once it's awarded? Um, and that depends on the type of assistance and a type of award that will be given. But for the most part, if a consultant is hired, um, the contract is between WFRC and the consultant, and it's subject to um, the city's approval. But the city itself will be the project manager um, as the as the project progresses. Um, if indeed um, WFRC, um, you know, and WFRC really does the administrative, the invoicing, and takes that burden off of the local government so that that kind of um, really helps streamline the project itself. If it's a different type of assistance that's awarded through training or for, through WFRC, um, that of course um, becomes a lot easier um, in terms of um, not having um, as many contracts between other parties. So hopefully that helps answer, answer that question. Yeah. And perhaps just to add to that a little bit, relative to a, a smaller communities, that I, if, if managing a project sounds like a burden for a smaller local government, then you do not need to feel like you have to play that role. Um, but we would like to understand that you don't want to play that role, and then we can take that into consideration. What we we want to make sure that we're helping uh, uh, both bigger, big and small communities uh, in this effort. But the basic rationale is that we believe that a project is more likely to be successful and meet your needs if you if you uh, exercise the control over it as the manager. <clears throat> Thanks, Ted. Uh, the next question is. Is it helpful to include letters of support from cities, counties, or other parties um, that are not part of the project or are co-applicants and will not be participating financially in the project? Yes, that would be helpful. Uh, any, any indication that there is a strong support for your project uh, would be uh, seen in a favorable light. Which, this question? Yep, if you okay. want to take that one. Okay, the question is, uh, it still appears that the cities that have the money are the cities that will receive the dollars. How can we match in kind with planning as we do not have a planner? And I, I tried to answer that uh, at, when we went through the webinar, but for communities that don't have a planner, uh, we understand. Uh, we take that into account. You do not need to feel like you have to come up with that in-kind match, which is what I think that question is about. If it's not about an in-kind match, uh, let us know. Um, but if, it's tr if there's a challenge in coming up with that in-kind match for a small city, uh, you do not need to feel like that's a fatal flaw. We would take that into account. 
and, uh, and, uh, and work with you. But if it's a larger city and we don't see an in-kind uh, uh, match, then it's, frankly, that's a bit of a red flag for us. So it, there is a real different treatment in, in, the, in that regard, in regard to the in-kind match based on the, the available uh, staff resources of a community. One more question that came up recently was, what if I submitted a letter of intent and I feel like I have a different project instead of the original project that I submitted within that letter of intent? Can I, in turn, switch and submit a project for a completely different one that wasn't approved? Um, and the answer to that would be a yes. We would just like a heads up that you guys would be switching and to have a conversation about it. Um, but, but that's all that we, we have through um, the question box. If there's anything else um, that anyone wanted to add, Ted's raising his hand here in case you all can. Well, I just want to I just want to <laughs> clarify that uh, this is not your only shot, um, and some of you will have more specific questions with regard to your application and your particular circumstances. And we're available to work through those with you, chat about an approach that makes sense. And, and I just want to clarify that our door is open. Uh, uh, reach out, um, and we'll talk about it. So um, anyway, that's, that's, that's all. That's great. Absolutely. And you know, both Val and my contact is up there if you guys want to have, you know, like we mentioned before, if you have a draft of your application and you want us to look at it, if you want to talk about any of how the tools can be integrated into your proposed project to explore if it is something that would, would fit well. Uh, we are available to you guys um, up until that January 15th deadline. So um, please do not hesitate to reach out and contact us. And uh, we also really appreciate you all taking the time um, to participate in this webinar as I think it's, it's helpful for us to learn from these questions and to just overall make the, the program and the application process better. So thank you all so much. and. Um, we look forward to reviewing your application. <laughs> All right. Take care. Have a wonderful day.